welcome everyone. We'll give everyone just a couple more minutes to join here, maybe one more minute. Thank you for joining us this evening. I think we have a great program and hopefully you enjoy it. All right. So I'm James Taylor. Uh, most of you probably know me from either an email or, or in my class um, in conservation biology. I'm the assistant director at the UNF Institute of Environmental Research and Education. We offer a range of programs for students and faculty from across the college. So we serve all students and all faculty. And we help faculty with research by offering grants and other assistance. But we also have a lot of great student programs, including workshops like tonight. So I want to introduce a few folks to you before we get into the program. Um, but first, I want to just uh, let everyone know that these events are part of a NOAA Marine Degree Brand, NOAA Marine Debris Program grant focused on reducing single-use plastic consumption and fostering long-term pro-environmental behaviors among undergraduates in coastal communities. So the goal is to reduce the generation of marine debris in those areas over time. In addition to these workshops, we also have cleanups um, scheduled. And one of the, the first cleanups of the semesters is this Saturday in the Springfield area, which is near downtown. And you can find all that information on our website. And I'll post it in the chat um, in just a moment. So tonight, we'll also um, be hearing a little bit from Aaron O, oh, our um, program assistant, who's directly working on this project, and also president of our um, UNFKO Honor Society. So she'll be managing the questions and answers at the end and might be interjecting here or there as well. And I also want to introduce Dr. Aaron Largo-White, uh, the director of the Institute of Environmental Education and Research and a professor in public health. You might Thank you so much. <laughs> Is this me? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, James. So I'm Aaron Largo-White. I am the director of IRI. And I'm also a professor in the Department of Public Health, as James said. Um, I'm also a co-investigator on this grant that we're going to be talking about. And I have the honor of introducing another co-investigator on this grant, who's our speaker tonight, and another one who's here in the room. Dr. Trulove, do you want to give a wave? There's Dr. Trulove, Dr. Heather Trulove from the Department of Psychology here at UNF. Um, okay, so... Erin O, oh, am I now introducing Dr. Jesse? I mean, Dr. Yeah. Sherry, I'm sorry. Dr. Okay. I mean, Dr. Jesse. <laughs> okay, Dr. Jesse, Dr. Sherry, okay. Um, so we are very pleased to have you here, Dr. Sherry. This is awesome. We're really excited. Um, Dr. Sherry is an associate professor at Eckerd College, and his research is focused on sustainable communities, green design, and life cycle assessment. And what he's going to be talking about today is focusing on that life cycle assessment part and talking and giving us some information about single use plastic and plastic in general, which is really relevant and central to our grant. So thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. All right, let's see how I do with getting the screen share to work right. <laughs> The, is the full screen version showing up? Because my computer has been weird and I should make sure it's good. All right. Okay. We see the one with, we do not see full screen. We can you see You do not slide, see full screen. That's what I was worried about. We do not see full screen. All right. Let me, let me try to fix the share. Right. Let's go. Let's, there it is. Better? Yes, we can see now. Okay, great. All right. So, um, as mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about plastics tonight, and there's a lot to, to say on both the good and the bad, and, and we'll kind of dig into that. Um, Dr. Logo Wright already introduced me, but as I mentioned, I am an environmental studies professor at Eckerd College, and as you know, as she alluded to, I was, I was hired initially to be kind of a sustainability person, and most of my research is life cycle assessment, which is this, you know, kind of elaborate computer modeling of a product or a process to determine its environmental impact. And what you get from that is a sense of not just what the overall impact is, but where it happens, right? So some products, it's really obvious. Um, you know, if you are operating, you know, like a, a simple hand pump or something, you're going to know that, like, it's mostly the manufacturer of the metal. But if you are getting some elaborate, you know, like iPhone, 
how do you know where the environment's impact came from? Does it matter how much you have it on, right? Is the main thing like you like plugging it in at night and, and that electricity? Or is the big thing the aluminum case or the microprocessors inside or something five steps back the supply chain where they actually initially extracted the silicon? Um, and so when you build this big life cycle assessment model, you can start to pull out those pieces and figure out where the concerns are and how to begin to ameliorate them, either from a design perspective or a policy perspective. Um, all right, so we have this kind of short video from, uh, I'm, I lost the story of stuff people, um, story of plastic. It does a decent job doing an overview of the life cycle of plastic. So I'm gonna let that run and then I'm gonna kind of supply context around it and answer any questions that you might have. And now I'm gonna have to switch what I'm sharing. Video working? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is that pure silver and straw? Maybe you even see how plastic is being found inside the fish we eat. The plastic price is that only hot of attention, but the headlines usually say the kind of plastic that ends up in the environment, and that's just part of it. The truth is, plastic has a whole life cycle. Dr. Sherry, can you turn the volume up? I have it up as much as it will go on. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Maybe. Hold on. I have another volume control. Maybe that will do it. I'm going to get loud in here. Try this. Over Better? 300 petrochemical plants in the U.S. alone by 2025. But these companies already produce more plastic. So where is all that plastic going? A lot of it's flowing into new markets in places like Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Because more than any other product category, plastic isn't driven by the demand for it, but by the supply. Corporations like Unilever, Nestle, and Procter & Gamble are aggressively marketing single-use plastic products around the world. These companies go to places like Indonesia, where I live, and push their products onto communities that just aren't prepared to deal with all that stuff. Maybe they're used to using natural packaging. Maybe they live on a tiny island without a system of use. And on top of that, countries in the global north are shipping their own plastic waste into these countries too. When you add that all up, it's no wonder so much of this plastic ends up in the environment. And globally, that's where a whopping 32% of plastic packaging comes from. 40% goes to a landfill, where plastic just piles up for future generations to deal with. And 14% is incinerated. Incineration is a nasty work, producing toxic smoke and fly ash. These super expensive facilities depend on plastic to burn everything else. It is oil and gas after all. So they want to see more plastic, not less. Then there's recycling. Unfortunately, it's not the solution that many people think of. Just 14% of plastic packaging gets recycled, and only 2% is effectively recycled, meaning it becomes something as useful as before. The rest is downcycled, something worse. And most recycled plastic is only recycled once before ending up in landfills, incinerators, or the environment anyway. So it turns out that we can't burn, bury, or recycle our way out of this problem. And we can't just scoop all that plastic out of the environment either. That's like trying to bail out a bathtub with a teaspoon while the tap is on full glass. So how about we turn off the tap by shutting down the plastic machine? That means tapping policies that create systemic change. 
by phasing out the single-use plastic that pollute the most, ending the fossil fuel subsidies that are fueling the economy, and feeding companies with plastic waste they create. That's how we can achieve our vision of a zero waste future, where all of our products and packaging can be reused or repaired, effectively recycled or composted, and ultimately how we create a sustainable circular economy that works for both people and the planet. This is story of plastic growth. All right, so hopefully you will. I'm sorry, I was too quiet at first. I guess my sound felt a little weird, but um, the good thing about that video is it goes through the life cycle pretty well. It provides some basic information. There's a couple of things I'm going to quibble with as we go through, but it's a good place to start. So um, I actually I watched that and I was preparing for today. And one of my first thoughts was just, you know, like, how big is this? And, you know, I went and looked up global uh, production of plastics, and we produce more than 350 million metric tons, which is about 770 billion pounds of plastic every year. Um, I looked, I tried to look up some comparable stuff. It's, it's not that far off from by weight, how much uh, iron we produce and how much cement we produce. Like it's, it's up there and those are significantly, you know, denser products. Um, roughly 40% of the packaging that we, the plastics that we produce is for packaging. Packaging is, probably the single biggest category. And that's really probably one of the biggest problems that we're looking at. And, you know, in terms of the argument about us, you know, using all of our oil for pla plastics, that is like less true than the video makes it look like, but about 10% of all oil use are used for plastics. So the vast majority is still used for transportation. And putting this kind of in a larger context, if you're not familiar, we are in a kind of a historical epic that has begun to be referred to as the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is the human era, right? This is the, the time of human beings. And the way that the anthropologists actually mark this is by the presence of plastics in the kind of layers of earth and kind of detritus that people dig up to look at the historical uh, kind of record. Right, so in, in lots of communities from an anthropological or archaeological perspective, you will take like a core sample and you will dig down and you will look for the presence of things like pottery chips or lead paint or other kinds of things to show where people technologically were at different points in time. And we've actually reached the point where the presence of plastic kind of marks the beginning of the human era. And if I, I go back for a second, you can see when this happened, right? Because 1950, um, we barely produced any plastic. And then 20 years later, we were producing about 50 million metric tons, and it has just steadily climbed since then. So we've really, since the 70s, been producing an increasing amount of plastic, and obviously it ends up out in our world. It doesn't end up, you know, secluded in our landfills or all incinerated or recycled. It ends up everywhere. And I think we've all had the experience of you walk on a, a riverbank or you go visit the ocean and at some point you're going to see plastic just kind of washing up out of the, the ocean. I actually, I have a video that I show in another class where it's a designer who had worked really hard to make a children's toothbrush. And so they, when, one of the things they had done is they had designed it with this big thick plastic handle so it would be easier for a kid to hold. And he then, the, the designer decided that they wanted to go on a vacation to the most remote place they could imagine. And so they like, sailed out to this island in the South Pacific and they step out of their, their tent in the morning and they go out to the ocean and their exact toothbrush that they had designed, it had only been in production for about six months and it was already washing up on this shoreline in this absolutely remote Southeastern Asian island. And so it just shows you how quickly uh, plastic spreads and how prevalent it is. This is the life cycle diagram that the, the video presents. And I think it's a really useful way to think about this. Most of us are familiar with products in the kind of consumption and disposal phase. And, you know, we're familiar with distribution in the sense of buying it, but we rarely are aware of the process of making it. Um, plastic may be, I think, in some ways, one of the ones that people are the most familiar with because you all know that it comes from oil. Uh, oil, you know, by itself doesn't make plastics, but actually it's oil mixed usually with a bunch of organic chemicals that are often also made from oil. 
that ends up in resulting in plastic. I've been to one or two manu uh, plastics manufacturing plants for work in the past. And you know they are they are they look exactly like factories that you imagine. Big tubes going everywhere, um, lots of kind of un indecipherable containers. Um, and the thing that's always really alarming too is lots and lots of waste. Um, I was at a plant that made vinyl uh, PVC, vinyl chloride, and they had this just mountain of like white. It looked like uh, really thick spider web, and it was all the just extra PVC that had kind of seeped out of like. The pipes and the corners and like it, it's just extra stuff that they didn't know what to do with and they just kind of pile it up in the corner of the facility waiting for someone to come along and find a way to dispose of it um, so anyway you know we have oil then we add a bunch of specific like plasticizers and different chemicals to it um, we then the one of the reasons the plastic is so prevalent is it's so easy to put into many 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 different forms and so in general, once you have these little beads of plastic, you melt them down and you form them into panels or bottles or cups or anything that you need. And from there, they're kind of sold and move out into the world. One of the questions that I think we don't think about anymore because we do live in this era of plastic is why? Like why is everything in plastic? Right, if you sitting wherever you are right now, I'm betting you can pick out 10 different plastic objects not to mention the very clothes that you're wearing, right? If your clothes are polyester or nylon, that those are plastics, right? Um, the buttons on your shirts, um, if you look around, I've got pens in front of me, my computer has a plastic case, the, the monitor has, right? It's, it is everywhere. And the reason why is that plastics are excellent in many, many ways. Um, they, you can make so many different types of plastic, right? You can make plastic that's extremely hard, you can make plastic that's extremely soft. You can make plastic that is see-through. You can make plastic that is opaque. You can make it shiny. You can make it rough. You can make it strong. You can make it flexible. Um, it is something that it is kind of the miracle product for manufacturers the world around. And it was that's the way it was sold for the first 40 or 50 years that plastics existed, right? It was just like, I have this miracle product for you. It can be anything. And we make it from oil, which we're already drilling for. So like what could possibly kind of go wrong? And so it is lightweight, it is strong, it is waterproof. Without plastic, think about how else you waterproof something, right? The old styles of waterproofing were about like taking leather and then impregnating it with oil over and over and over again. Something you have to do constantly. Um, it's moldable and it's dirt cheap. Um, and this is why we have plastic everywhere. You know, the top photo there is of a car and it's showing to a certain extent all the different types of plastics that are in your car. Remember cars used to be made out of metal. Like I never had one of those cars, but there were, there were days when the cars that rode around were these giant metal tanks and they have gradually, every bit of them pretty much, except for the frame has been replaced by plastic. And it's lighter, it's cheaper. You can make it whatever shape, color, size, et cetera you want. And so we have plastic everywhere. So what went wrong, right? We have this miracle material, we have these plastics, they solve all of manufacturing's problems. Like what, what's that? Well, in a single word, it's packaging, right? Because as much as like the car is made out of plastic, that car is a durable good. It's gonna be there for 10, maybe 15, 20 years. Um, similarly, like even clothing, like I, I don't know about you all, but I still have clothing I wore in college. I have clothing like 20 years later. Um, fast fashion is a whole different story, but clothing can last an extraordinarily long time. Lots of things that are made with plastic are durable goods. But packaging is the exact opposite of that, right? Pa packaging is a product that is specifically designed to exist only to hold something else and only temporarily. And probably one of the worst examples of the kind of sin of packaging is plastic bags. Each year, each this, this blew me away, each year we produce four to five trillion plastic bags. There are seven and a half billion people in the world. That is in the neighborhood of 700 plastic bags per person per year. That is an extraordinary number of plastic bags. I mean, like, I, if you offered me 700 plastic bags at the beginning of every year, I would not know what to do with them. But you, if you think about, you know, the trash bags and the shopping bags, and I like, I went to Costco the other day and I bought bread, right? And bread comes in two individual plastic bags, 
wrapped in another plastic bag to hold the two of them together. I, I don't know why that's necessary, but it is not necessary. It is, but it is the way things are done, right? And the average useful life, particularly of a shopping bag, is about 15 to 20 minutes, right? You go to Publix, they fill up your bag, you put it in the car or you put it on your bike, you walk, you drive home, whatever, you unpack it, it served its purpose. That was its whole life, you know, hooray for it. That plastic bag will take 500 to 1,000 years to fully break. So you have a plastic bag that is useful for 15 to 20 minutes and is going to exist for 500 to 1,000 years. Um, and so there's a, there's a principle in the kind of growing field of green design that you should design things to last about as long as they are useful, right? And that makes sense. If you're going to have something that's super temporary, it should almost immediately begin to decompose. And the, the example I always love to think about are fruit. Like, if you think about the peel of a fruit, it's basically like a good package, right? Like a banana peel or like an orange peel, any of those. Like, it keeps the fruit safe. It protects it, keeps it fresh. You peel off the peel, you eat the fruit, and the packaging, the, the peel, is almost immediately, you throw it outside and it'll be gone in a week, especially before it's gonna be gone in a couple of days. Um, you know, you compost it, it'll compost, it'll break down, it'll go away. And not in the sense that like you won't see it anymore, but in the sense that it'll actually break down and add to the soil. And, you know, that makes sense. So that is kind of a sensible packaging. What we have is almost an insane level of packaging. Um, and obviously, as this plastic breaks down, it doesn't become soil. It breaks down into what we call microplastics, right? It breaks down into, and microplastics sounds so official, it breaks down into tiny little bits of plastic, right? Like it just gets smaller, it physically degrades. Um, and as it gets smaller, it gets eaten by things. Uh, the video showed like, you know, fish with plastic in their stomach, but it happens all over the place and all over the time. And ultimately it does end up in the ocean where it continues to degrade and gets smaller and smaller, but it doesn't break down to its constituent chemicals and become relatively harmless for a very, very long time. So, you know, what happens to our packaging? Well, I think all of us, you know, and I'm, I'm watching it like, like from the outside now. My daughter is in elementary school and is already being kind of taught the, uh, the I don't know, it's almost like a, the religious rite of recycling, right? It's just like, what is a good thing to do? It is to recycle. Um, and so for a long time, I think people thought, well, the answer to plastic waste is recycling. We just need to recycle more. We need to really bother our parents and tell them to recycle. Uh, we need to train kids to an army of recyclers. We need recycling bins everywhere. Well, we've been at this at least since I was a kid. So at least for you know 30-ish years. And at this point, 8.5% of plastic in the US is recycled. And that was in 2018. And that was, I hate to say it, but that was the good old days. Um, in 2019, China had what they called uh, Operation National Sword which was basically China turned around to the rest of the world and said, we don't want you trash it, take it back. Um, what had been going on, right, was China would ship products to the US and these containers would arrive, we would unload them, and then we would literally load all of our recyclables back into those shipping containers and ship them back to the US. They were not recyclables that were like ready to be recycled. These were basically piles of trash that we claimed were recycled. Um, and, China decided no more. And the recycling industry, if you're not aware, is in free fall right now. Um, it's, it's absolutely falling apart. Uh, the recycling center near us, they have to send about 80% of the material that they receive off to the landfill because it's, it's mixed, it's dirty, it's contaminated, it's not actually recyclable, right? And, and that's all the stuff we used to send to China. And now we can't. And so the, the functional recycling rate is actually um, and a lot of things that are plastic are, are just impossible to recycle. Um, the, the offender that I always pull out in my classes is the chip bag, right? We've all bought chips. The outside is plastic. The inside is foil, right? It's that shiny, bright metallic foil. And the metallic foil is there because it's better at forming an airtight seal. So it keeps the chips pressure. You cannot recycle that plastic and you cannot recycle that foil because they have been bound to each other, right? To recycle something, it has to be just what it is. It has to be just PET or just metal, right? But you can't have the two of them glued to each other and recycle. 
So we're constantly creating products that are just impossible to recycle. And then the real kicker for recycling is that recycling is a business. This is the part that I think people don't realize a lot of the time. When a recycler takes your plastic or your glass or your metal, they have to sell it to somebody, right? They, they have to have somebody out there who wants to buy your old plastic, metal, or glass, or else they just have to stockpile it. And then they, then they don't make a profit, and then they go out of business, and they stop accepting recycling. And right now, if you want to recycle metal, go for it, right? Like any piece of metal that you want to recycle, there is a market for it. Somebody will pay you for aluminum or steel to recycle. If you want to recycle paper, there's actually a very strong market for that. People will pay you for old cardboard and for paper and all those kinds of things that they make in the recycle. If you want to recycle plastic, they pretty much don't want anything to do with it. Um, plastic is so frequently contaminated and so frequently mixed, and oil is so cheap that it is much cheaper to get virgin plastic beads than it is to get recycled plastic beads. And the recycled plastic beads are probably contaminated, so they're going to have they're going to lose some level of production because something else is mixed in. And so, you know, while metals recycling works really, really well and paper recycling works relatively well, at this point, plastic recycling does not work well. Also, unfortunately, glass recycling does not work very well. Um, it's a whole separate story, but um, one of the things that I've started having to tell students here is that if you're going to recycle metal or paper, go for it. If you're going to recycle glass, it's almost a don't even bother, like just put it in the trash because they will not recycle it. I have been to recycling centers where they have mountains of mixed glass and they have nothing to do with them. And only recycle the plastic that is pristine, right? If, if it is like, if it's plastic that is completely clean and is all one thing, it doesn't have like an extra ring like attached to it or something else, stuff like that, then, you know, yogurt containers are a great example, right? Like they're the big ones. They are all, they are all actually like polypropylene. If they're clean, they're really easy to recycle. But even like the soda bottles where they have that extra ring that's like kind of tucked under it, that can be can be a different plastic and can contaminate the plastic. It's, it's rough. So then if we're still thinking about end of life, there's incineration. And this is where I most strongly disagree with the video. And I think the difference is the video, the woman specifically said that she was from Indonesia. And incineration in the developed world is very different than incineration in the development. Um, and so I just wanted that to be clear because I'm not saying that they are wrong, but it is very dependent on where you are. So incineration in the developed world is not ideal, but it's probably our best option as long as we are still dealing with lots and lots of single use plastic. And there's, there's three basic reasons for that, right? So the one is in the incinerators, the modern incinerators in this country are energy producers. They're called you know, energy, waste to energy facilities or energy recovery facilities. And basically what they're doing is they are, no, sorry, my words just doesn't really matter. Um, the, uh, they are burning the trash in order to make electricity, the exact same way we would burn coal or natural gas or oil to make electricity. And we all know that that's problematic, and it is, but What's different here is when you burn, the, you, you have to do something with the trash. And if it's not going to get recycled and it's your choice between incineration and the landfill, I would go for incineration. And that's because you generate electricity. The, they are required to incinerate at very high temperatures, which actually breaks down a lot of the bad chemicals. Like uh, dioxin is a classic one. Uh, it's, it's when you burn PVC at low temperatures, it releases lots of dioxin, which is a cancer causing chemical. If you burn PVC upwards of 700 degrees, it breaks the dioxin down into its constituent parts. And so you're essentially not emitting the cancer causing compound, you're emitting some more basic element. And then uh, any good incin modern incinerator should have chemical scrubbers. So they're there to remove sulfur dioxide, to remove nitrous oxides, to remove some of the more harmful chemicals that, that are, can be basically pulled out of the smoke before it goes. You're still releasing CO2 you're still like going to have some ash. It's not ideal. But if your choice is that, or you dig a hole, you put it in the hole, you let it rot and break down and basically probably contaminate groundwater and eventually generate a whole bunch of methane, like, and in an uncontrolled fashion for the most part, you're better off with the incinerator than you are with the landfill. And people can argue with me on that. I'm happy to have that. Um, so incineration right now is about 15% of our plastic waste. 
unfortunately, landfills are 75 plus percent. And this is just American waste policy. Uh, in, in America, we do far more landfill than we do anything. If you go to Western Europe, it's the, the inverse, right? Because they have been developed just as long, but they have no land left over to put in landfills, and so they incinerate them. And they do some really cool things. There are incinerators in parts of Europe where they've actually put them in as like focal pieces. So there's a, there's one in the Netherlands, I think that's a ski slope. Um, so people can come and like ski down the like incinerator. There's one where um, someone designed it to capture the smoke in like a bell shape and release it all at once. So for every ton of trash that's incinerated, it pops out basically like a smoke ring. Um, so you can like almost be like counting the amount of trash that's being incinerated. Like they're trying to like kind of be honest about what these are rather than hide it. So what is the future of plastic? And you know, obviously the key question here is like, should, should there be a, a future of plastic? And I think it's a really negotiable question. Like, as I've said, plastics have amazing abilities. Um, outside of packaging, they can make really functional, durable goods, but obviously they are hugely problematic. And so my thoughts on this are one, if you're gonna have plastic, it should be closed loop meaning it should be truly compostable. And I, I say truly compostable. If you, are, if you are one of those people who has, you know, out of good intentions, purchased the like compostable plastic silverware for an event, um, I hope that you have a connection to an industrial compost because that stuff only breaks down um, if it's at 140 degrees for more than 30 days, which is not your home compost. I mean, unless you're way more devoted than I. Right. I compost, but my, my bit, my pile does not stay at 140 degrees for a month at a time. Um, so truly compostable, completely reused. There are some companies that have, uh, Puma has an example of this, where they've started to collect back all of their old clothes that they can get, take them apart and reuse the pieces and, and actually like functionally reuse them, which is good. Or it needs to be 100% recyclable, right? No chip bag, no mixed materials. Um, it needs to be created in a way that is 100% recyclable. And even that's not enough, right? Recyclable is potential. It needs to be 100% recycled, um, which means you have to change production methods so that you can take in recycled products. You need to build your products for them. Um, regardless, plastic should not be used for packaging or we need very short life plastic. There is the very beginning of this. There are some companies that have started to produce basically edible plastic. It is plastic that you can digest. Um, it doesn't have anything in it that is toxic or harmful, and it's simple enough of a chemical that it will break down in the human digestive system. It will also break down in a home composting bin. Um, but like again, this is like this is niche business at this point. These are not things that are easy to find, and I'm sure they're also very expensive. Um, and then the other one that I, I hear a lot is, but there's some companies out there that are making uh, packaging from the plastic in the great garbage patch. Like, isn't that wonderful? It's a it's a publicity stunt, right? Like, there's so much plastic out there, and as I've said, it's incredibly hard to make things from mixed plastics. So these are companies that are basically going out, scooping up a whole bunch of the trash, very carefully sorting it, and they're making these kind of gray plastic containers that stand out because they're not brightly colored, and like they'll call it out as like great garbage patch like plastic. But you know, it's it's very much a too little, too late, right? Like I, I anyway, I, I'm less than impressed. Um, and so how do we get there, right? If that's the future of plastics, well, on a personal level, we avoid single-use plastics whenever possible. You know, don't use them. If you can avoid it, try to remember to bring your bags to the grocery store. But also, like, um, well, I was, I, I packed my daughter's lunch every morning, and she had been begging for, like, juice boxes. And so I bought some juice boxes, and I'm putting them in, and then I'm looking at them, and I'm realizing that they're chip bags, right? They're foil on the inside, they're a layer of cardboard, and then they're plastic on the outside. So they are what would otherwise be three recyclable materials welded together so that they can never be recycled. And, um, and so I went on online, and it's actually really hard to find small, reusable plastic bottles, right? If you want like 16 ounces, you're fine. But if you're trying to give like a six-year-old enough juice that she like will be happy but won't go insane, it's, it's actually quite difficult to find these bottles. And so I, I found these like tiny little six-ounce bottles um, they're screw top, and you know I started using them. 
And you know, it's it's a small thing. It's not going to save the world, but like it's a little bit of a step in the right direction. It's kind of a, a cultural change. So do that when you can. The next thing to do is to demand and purchase products that are made from high amounts of recycled content. Not like when you use, if you look at a product and it has the nice little three arrows on it, that means nothing, right? Um, if it says that it's recyclable, that means nothing. That everything is like ostensibly recyclable. You want to see like 20, 30, 40%, preferably post-consumer recycled content. Um, you're not going to find that too often. It's it's maybe um, maybe some special plastics, like, like long-term water bottles might do that, and some papers. But we need to look for those products and buy them because, as I said, recycling is a marketplace. It's a business. And if you don't demand recycled products, they're not going to make them. Um, you want products that are designed for a circular economy, and that was kind of touched on in the video, right? Things that are designed to be reused and remade and reworked over and over again. And you want products that break down extremely quickly, truly compostable products. So those are what you can, that's how you can like spend your way into this. The other thing that I think is really important is, you know, you need to lobby for, for what are called producer responsibility laws or producer liability laws. Um, these are much more popular in Germany than they are here. But essentially, these are laws that makes someone who produces a product responsible for its eventual end of life, right? So if I make a car and I put 15 plastics in that car, then I'm responsible for what happens to that car at the end of its life. I have to either pay into a fund or create a production line where I take all my cars back and I take them apart and I reuse them. And that, that does exist in Germany. It's very complex, it's very technical, it's very expensive. It's not the perfect system. But what it did was it forced BMW to redesign their cars so that they went from 15 plastic resins to four. And so then their product become much easier to take apart, much easier to recycle. And they only did that because they were forced to be responsible for their product. And really applying pressure to the system is about the only way we're going to see change. Right? There's not like a kind of groundswell of desire amongst the companies that produce these plastics to do something. Like so it's only from external pressure that we'll do. Oops. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, questions. Uh, things people are curious about it can be plastics, it can be life cycle in general, it can be that. I'm also the guy that answers the questions that like people always have about like, well, which is worse, right? And they just like, is it worse if I like drive my car or if I fly somewhere? Uh, I just had a colleague say, well, I, my lawn died and I kind of want to buy that like fake turf, but am I being horrible if I like roll out this plastic turf as an environmental studies professor? Like I, I can give you a somewhere in the, the spectrum of correct to at least reasonable answer to most of this. Anything anybody wants to know? Sure. So you talked about like um, like little rings on water bottles and how it's like different plastics. So when you're recycling, it, everything has to be the same or else like, is it like almost like in like, like blacksmithing where it's like if you are like melting down something, you have like the slag on top, it's like, but that's all mixed into it. You can't take it out. Yes, that is pretty much how it goes. So if you ever, there's, there's some good videos online of like what happens at a MRF, a materials recovery facility. And um, you'll see that basically like the first all the materials kind of get sorted. There's like puffs of air and there's a, there's a lot of people involved too. It's very like, like uh, manual labor. But eventually the plastic containers get shredded. There's like big like kind of cutting knives that shred them up and then they get melted. And if you have small bits of, you know, like um, polypropylene mixed in with your uh, PET, then that, when they melt it, it's going to mix in a little bit, and then they're going to, they're basically going to break it into, um, oh, I forgot the term, they're little pellets, but they're, they're called like nurdles or something, there's some weird term for plastic pellets, um, and some of those are going to have the wrong plastic, and they're going to have bits of the wrong plastic, and so when they go to make like a new plastic water bottle, they're going to remelt it, and parts of it's going to melt, and parts of it is not going to melt, and it's going to ruin not only that piece, but some level of the whole production line of materials will actually get ruined. But even like perfectly good stuff will end up ruined because of the contamination that's kind of early. Uh, and that's why it's one of the reasons companies can be very low to actually make stuff with recycled content. I have a question. Oh. Okay, no, I was just going to ask if someone had more questions and you have a question. So go ahead. I do, I do have a question. So I know you were mentioning um, 
how you prefer incineration versus um, landfills and like based off of when we're talking about maybe like emissions are landfill emissions worse than incineration emissions out when burning and that whole process like what's the deal with that there's a lot there yeah let me let me think about the best way to answer that um so again first things first i'm talking about when i say incineration i'm talking about a modern waste to energy like facility with scrubbers on the smokestacks right like i'm not talking about uh, I'm, I'm probably not talking about your like developing world incinerator that was like put together relatively quickly. I'm certainly not talking about like burning your plastics in your backyard, which I know people do. Um, at that point, with an incinerator, you are, what I'll say is you are acknowledging what is going on and you are dealing with it to a greater extent because you are burning. There is going to be ash. Usually the ash is landfill. Like, so here in St. Petersburg, it's actually, convenient, we have a waste to energy facility and I've visited it several times, right? And so they collect all the trash, but we're very, we're very shy on land here. And so they take the trash and they, they burn it and they generate, uh, I think like 11% of the electricity that's like used here in the county comes from the waste to energy. Um, then they bury the ash. So they, they landfill the ash um, and they bury over it. And so it's, it is still a landfill. It's still like a lined landfill. All the ash goes back in there. So the advantages here are you get electricity, you vastly reduce the mass that you're burning, um, and you are able to you're able to break down a lot of really complicated, potentially dangerous chemicals, right? Um, that's th those are the advantages. Um, if you just landfill that stuff, what usually happens with it is it does break down anaerobically, so you get a lot of methane. Some very few places do tap that methane and use it to generate power, but it's actually quite unusual, uh, partially because landfills are often built way far away from everything. And so utilizing them is not like a high priority for a lot of places. Um, but the other thing that happens in a landfill is you basically have created like a soup of all the trash. Like it's all just like mixed together in there, water gets in there, things start to break down. Uh, modern landfills have to be lined with pretty thick plastic to keep the stuff in there, but that only lasts for so long. Um, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, eventually the lining breaks down and you begin to contaminate ground. Um, and so that is, is deeply problematic because we are extremely bad at cleaning up ground and water contamination. Like the major method for cleaning up pollution that's in the ground usually is diluting it, right? They just blast it with water until it is like a low enough parts per million that it's no longer dangerous. Um, and so to a certain extent, like I can't say that there's less emissions from incineration than from something else, but I think you are dealing with a lot of the emissions up front with the scrubbers and with the high heat and you're getting something useful out of it, which is the electricity. Um, you still have some risk, right? You still have all the ash still in a landfill, still maybe going to contaminate groundwater eventually. Um, still not good. That's what I'm saying. Like, incineration is not like good. It is just better than straight up landfills. And that's, that's about all I can say. And again, specifically in terms of plastics, there may be other products that it's better to landfill. I actually don't know what that would be off the top of my head. Um, I think most things are probably better going for a waste energy facility, but I, I'm not going to claim expert knowledge on all this. That would be very, very uh, a, a big example of hubris. I would, I would expect someone to come up and really knock me down. So we have a few questions from um, the chat. The first one is from Kelly, and she says, "How do you recommend undergraduate students or general community members get into lobbying? What organizations should we be supporting in this effort?" Oh, that's a good one. Um, so especially for students getting into lobbying, I may not know the right organization because I would say go with a local organization, right? Um, groups that, you know, very, especially if you are trying to get at the ground level of something, grassroots is the way to go. They always need people, they always need energy, and they're not going to be like, well, we're going to have to train you for a year before you're really useful to us. They'll like, they'll kind of get your feet wet real fast. Um, one thing that I know you probably have on campus, I know we have on campus, is, is PERG, the Public Interest Research Group. Um, and they do great work. Um, I interacted a lot with them when I was at Rutgers. 
I've interacted with students in, involved in, in those organizations here. They do a lot to get people out to the polls. They uh, usually have their pulse on uh, issues that are going on on campus and in the surrounding community. And they're usually relatively well organized and obviously very open to students. Just to speak on PERG, um, I actually am in contact with the PERG representative who's reached out to us. So um, Kelly, if you'd like, I can send you my email and I can put you in contact with our PERG coordinator because I know she's been um, talking to me about, we've been talking about single use plastics and um, plastic reduction. So I'll send you my information and then we can get you connected with PERG. Um, the next question is from Kirsten and she says, um, should we be making sure everything is totally separated before we throw it in the recycle bin, take caps off bottles, et cetera? So here's, here's the part where I don't want to bum people out too much. <laughs> um, the, the recycling system in America is deeply broken right now. It just really, really is. Uh, we were heavily, heavily reliant on China to take all of our waste in a somewhat unprocessed state and deal with it, and we have not recovered from that. Um, I don't know what's going on specifically right where you are. I know what's going on in St. Pete. I know that, you know, we've had professors take students out there and they literally say 70% of the recyclables that they get, they have to turn around and send it. Um, so yes, by all means, if you want your stuff to actually get recycled, have it be clean, have it be separated, have it be as pure as possible. Um, but know that you may be, I don't know, you may be a, a, be a little bit of Don Quixote, right? Like you may just be a little bit like kind of hoping for the best without really having any reason to believe that things are, are working well. Um, if you want to fix recycling, it's, it's about the demand side. We need more things to be made with recycled content. We need people to be demanding products made from recycled content. And that will actually get companies to ask for recyclables, and that will make the recycling system work. And I have some experience doing that. I actually worked with a company that decided to, it was a building products company. Uh, we were sustainability consultants for them. And we got them to develop a system where they would take back they're old, uh, they made, amongst other things, they made vinyl siding. We got them to where they would like develop a system where they would actually take back the scrap from the building site and bring it back to the factory and melt it down and make siding from recycled content. It took us a year of just working to convince them that people would buy it um, because they tried it in the 70s and it had a bad re reputation and like they hadn't ever tried again. So, if you can somehow convince a company or a purchaser or whoever to demand recycled content products, that is probably the best thing you can do for the recycling industry. I have a um, follow-up question. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm cutting somebody off. Oh, I mean, if it's uh, a follow-up question, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, I have a follow-up question that I think Dr. True Love and I probably are both wondering. I don't know if for sure, but I have, some research where I was, you know, back in the day studying the determinants of recycling behavior. So it's crushing, like it's a personal crushing that recycling, I mean, from a personal perspective, it's crushing. And then also kind of professionally, it's kind of sad too. But yeah. um, my, my question is, so when you talk about the, the campaigns that were, you know, when in doubt, throw it out kind of stuff, what, mm -hmm. is, is that like, is individual health behavior change worth it at all or is it just like even if it's pristine even if the whole neighborhood does it well it's still there's just not a demand there so it's still not something we should be putting our efforts into trying to fix on the individual behavior set behavior change side of things is all that... i can speak for is right now right now recycle your paper and your metal throw everything up in the trash <laughs> like I, I i hate to be that blunt but that is really where we are if you recycle your paper and your metal it will get made into new things and then if, if you, you see your neighbors like next to you like recycling for for example today i saw there was pillows in the recycling bin in my neighbors and i'm like oh my gosh so like because it's all going in the same truck does that sort of negate any effort of even if you do have pristine paper no. and metal or there will be some level of no because it, it will go to a MRF, right it will go to a materials recovery facility it will attempt to be separated and sorted pillows right. will very quickly be removed <laughs> yeah. from actual like potentially recycled products the yeah. the challenge is 
more than the pillows are the like the plastic bottle with the wrapper and the ring, right? And that's like, it's usually three different types of plastic that are connected to each other. Um, and those, the machines don't handle well. It's not worth it to have people do it. Like it's it's not great. Uh, but the pillows, like someone immediately is gonna throw those in the trash, right? Like <laughs> that, that's, um, but yes, don't, don't the, the less trash that goes into a recycling bin, the more likely your recycling company is to survive the next five years. I mean, that's really where we are, is will the recycling companies like stay in business or will they completely disappear? So when in doubt, throw it out messaging may be something that we continue to at least, in, in addition to our reducing single use plastic use, which is what we're doing, but also in addition, that may be something that's not totally wasted. Yeah, and, and I'll, I will say like, you can, one message that might be worth it is like, Reduce single use plastic because recycling is broken right now. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, because yeah. often people treat recycling like it's like the magical band aid that's going to like sweep up, sweep in after everything and like make it better. And it's just not. Yeah. Um, and maybe that harsh reality can be useful in getting people to actually work on what is what are supposed to be the first two steps, right? It's supposed to be, re it's a prioritized thing. Reduce, use, reuse, right. recycle, not right. equally valid. One, two, three. Um, and three is broken right now. So it's not there to catch the, the trash. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Aaron. It's a sad world. Right now. We have a question from Nathaniel and then Kirsten. Okay. Um, so heard you talking about recycling, uh, you know, phrases uh, and paper and metal, uh, but it's when it specifically becomes the plastic, let's say just in sort of the realm of advocacy, do you think um, advocacy is better spent for trying to fix recycling for plastics, or do you think it's better spent trying to advocate for, you know, what you're offering in terms of, you know, advanced incineration? Oh boy. Um... The only thing that's going to fix recycling, as far as I can tell, and this is it, we're, we're, we're in, remember I said I'd be in the spectrum from like reasonable to like pretty, right? We're in my like reasonable territory. I am, I'm extrapolating on my own experience and my own understanding of this right now. But as far as I can tell, the only thing that's going to fix recycling is demand for recycled products um, or some magical new technology. And I say that, and I kind of sound ludicrous when I say magical new technology. I have watched videos of magical new technology. There's some Israeli company that is taking municipal solid waste, right? Just the trash that we toss out. And they have some technique that they're using that they won't tell people how it works because it's their bread and butter and out comes plastic. And I don't, I don't get it. Like it was like chicken bones in plastic out. And like, I watched the videos. I know they have clients. Like they, uh, they have an arrangement with some uh, waste companies in Virginia. They have an arrangement with the largest McDonald's franchiser in South America. There's some company that owns like thousands of McDonald's franchises. And they're getting this company. I think it's called UDQ to make their furniture out of this mystical plastic that's made from municipal solid waste. Right. So when I say some magical technology, I'm not like. I'm not being ridiculous. Like there might be one of those coming, but current technology, current recycling industry, the only way we get there is massive demand for recycled products. Um, I don't think it's worth, I don't think advocacy is the right tool to get recycling fixed right now. Um, unless you are out there like advocating for people to buy products that to a large extent don't exist yet. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I think I think I, I think advocating locally for a waste energy facility in place of a landfill is not a bad plan. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and again, like I don't love. I come around. I come across as like Mister Lover of Incinerators. Um, I don't think they're great. They don't make me happy, but they are the the best of a bad bunch. Uh, and I've had this conversation with you know like um, we have we have this actually really interesting program at Eckerd called Aspect where like retired professionals will come and speak and everything. And I had, um, I had a woman who got the first waste to energy facility built in Maryland. And like, we had this big conversation about this and, and she and I were basically on exactly the same page. You know, it was like, this is not like the world's best technology, but it is of all the waste disposal things we have available. It is the best one. And it's what we got now. So. And then there were Houston, I think. 
Yes, her question says, um, how do you feel about TerraCycle and uh, or the plastic bag returns at the grocery store? Um, TerraCycle is interesting. Um, I, I mean, I'm all in favor of them existing. Every time I've talked to somebody that's worked with TerraCycle, TerraCycle is very expensive. That's really just all it boils down to. Like TerraCycle, if you're not familiar, uh, TerraCycle is this company that runs like a whole host of recycling programs, and they they attempt to recycle pretty much everything. Um, and, I, and I think they do it legitimately. Like, I don't think they are like a shill or like a weird cover for some like questionable operation. And, and again, I say that like there are actually a lot of e-waste companies that claim to break down e-waste and then they just ship it to China or Vietnam. Um, so I think TerraCycle generally is a good thing. But in all my like, experiences of talking to people who are customers of TerraCycle, it is a very expensive service, which is kind of what you would expect, right? They're trying to recycle nearly everything. So if you want to give TerraCycle a lot of money, they will make a real, like, serious effort at recycling. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This what was the second one? It was the plastic bag recovery. Things? Yes, uh, the plastic bag recovery bins at the grocery store. Yeah, put them in there. Um, the nice thing about the plastic bins, uh, the plastic bag bins are well, they should be all plastic bags, right? It kind of hopefully, I mean, there's of course people leave receipts in there. And it's kind of nonsense, but. You know, put your plastic bags in there. Um, from what I've heard, the recycling of those plastic bags is <laughs> is a mixed bag. Um, is is a um, a half and half kind of situation, right? Like it's better than nothing. It does happen. Things do re get recycled, but those plastic bags are really hard on the machines. They tend to gum up recycling machines. They tend to cause trouble. So if nothing else, put them in those bins at the grocery store and not your bin at home. Um, anything you can do to not put those plastic carrier bags in your bin at home is, is a plus. Because um, they are just, they're horrible for the mixed waste machines. So we have, um, I think maybe two more questions. I'm not sure if yours is a statement or a question, Dr. J, but um, we have questions and then after those are answered, we'll um, end. But then if anybody has any other questions and if Dr. Sherry is willing to stay to answer, we can, um, Talk about those after, but um, first I'll say, Dr. J, is your statement reduce, reuse, and how about reduce, reuse, and refuse? That a statement or a question? It's a little of both. So the, the refuse um, is becoming a, a, um, a, a strategy for dealing with plastic. I mean, it drives me nuts when you know you get a prescription at Publix, and not only do they put it in a plastic container, but then they put it in a plastic bag they then put in one of the plastic grocery bags. It's like I found out you can actually refuse to take the Ziploc bag. You have to take it and give it right back to them, but you, you can refuse to take that with you. I'm just, you know, does that help? Uh, yeah, when, that when that they... absolutely helps. Um, and, and yeah, if you were doing the hierarchy, it's probably refuse, which is a, a, a subset in some ways of reduce, but refuse, reduce, reuse, right? Um, because if you never take it, then it's there for the next person and ostensibly there for however long, you know, those are fewer bags that they order, those are fewer bags that end up. But is it really going back to the next person or is it going in the garbage? Because I've had that experience too, where they give you the bag and you say, I, no, thank you. I don't want it. And, and they, they literally it take it and put it in the garbage because for whatever reason, and maybe COVID now it's a little different, but like they can't give it to the next person. So no, it's not COVID. Um, it, it depends on the employee and how they're trained and what the business is. Um, but um, almost, I, I've worked a lot of retail <laughs> um, in various forms and you know, the, the, the policy is almost always like, it's when in doubt, throw it out. And like doubt is like, is there ever, ever a sliver of doubt in your mind that like someone would feel comfortable taking this, then just throw it away. Um, but still, if, if the more that people refuse, then maybe the next time Dr. J shows up, they don't even hand him the Ziploc bag, right? They, they see him enough and they're like, oh, here we are. And then the, the Ziploc bag never gets pulled and it doesn't, you know, it, it's not used. And so it doesn't get thrown away. Or maybe eventually they get to the point where enough people say no thank you that they ask, right? They say like, do you want a Ziploc bag? Well, and, and you get the chance to say no, right? Um, so I think I think the, the nice thing about refuse is it's very visible, right? Like reducing, reusing, even recycling, these are all invisible activities to the companies providing you with the plastic. Refusing, especially vocal refusal where you're like, no thank you, 
um, that's that's noticeable. And if like 100 people a day say no thank you, then company policy will change because if nothing else, those plastic bags cost public money, right? They don't cost them a lot, they cost them something. And if enough people are saying, I don't want it, then why would they be giving it away and like losing, you know, a tiny bit of profit for that? Thank you. Um, since we've come to the end of our time block, I'll just formally say first, and then we can come back if you would like to answer any other questions. But thank you so much, um, Dr. Sherry, for, for joining us and for informing us about all of these different um, practices. And I hope that all of the students and faculty who have attended um, continue supporting the, the NOAA grant projects. And um, we have a cleanup coming up, um, Elena, Actually, if you want to quickly mention the cleanup while you're here. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Elena. I am hosting the NOAA community cleanups. Um, our first cleanup is on Saturday at Henry J. Clutha Park. If you go on the Institute's website, you will find information about our cleanup and you can sign up. I think uh, James already sent the link on the chat if you're interested. Um, you know, Aaron sent the link too. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's this Saturday. Um, I'm not sure if the time updated for anyone who has already signed up or who hasn't. The time, time updated to 9.45, not nine. So please <laughs> show up at 9.45. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you, Elena. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cherry, and thank you, Dr. Trulove and Dr. Roger White um, for attending, and, and Dr. J. Um, and Dr. Sherry, are you okay with sticking around for a few minutes to answer any lingering questions? Yeah, my wife told me it was okay to be a little bit late for bedtime, so I, uh, I, might, I might get out of putting the twins to bed, which I love them, but oh boy, three-year-old twins are a challenge in every possible setting. So, I'll happily answer some more questions. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have a question. I'm just thinking about um, all of these students and we've been talking about individual behavior a lot. And, um, you know, that's what I study and what Dr. Lago White studies. And, you know, we sort of dedicated our career to changing one person's behavior at a time with the idea that if a lot of us change our behavior, then we could have a real impact. And I think that that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, but something that you mentioned, I think that was sort of interesting is having us reflect on like the limited space we have to make choices. And like with the life cycle assessment perspective, like which choice is going to make the most impact. So yeah. I just sort of wonder um, within the plastic domain, but even more broadly, like when we start to think about pro-environmental behavior, like what should we as, you know, older faculty, but as younger students, you know, try to do, like, should we try to change one behavior and really focus our energy on a really important behavior? Should we try to, to lobby, you know, as you mentioned, to try to change policies like at UNF, you know, we don't like, like Eckert, I think has a ban on plastic. We don't have that at UNF. Like, mm -hmm. is that what students and faculty should be focusing on to ban plastic even coming on campus? We have a, um, I think a contract either with Pepsi or Coke uh, <laughs> that provides plastic water bottles. <laughs> so it's hard yeah. for us to kind of move around some of those um, constraints, but I guess I just wonder so I don't leave this talk so incredibly depressed. <laughs> Please give me something to focus my energy on okay. um, that can actually make a difference. Can, yeah, can I take oh. a quick, can okay. I make a quick comment? Cause I Please. think, answer this question cause it has to do with Heather's question. Um, I've heard that student action had a lot to do with the ban on plastic at Eckerd. Is that, is that correct? It's true, yeah. Uh, the initial impetus was this was the student environmental group on campus pushing for a ban on single use. Um, the president, God, forever ago, signed the like president's climate commitment thing. And the, inter the interesting thing about that, that is like the climate commitment was toothless, but it was a wedge because like the president signed this. And then every time the students like wanted to change environmental behavior, they'd be like, well, you signed the climate commitment. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, they'd be like, you already expressed some interest in this. You already committed to doing something. Here's something you can do. Um, and, and so that, that did help. And then I think, um, I think that combined with the, at the same time, uh, Sh Shannon and Amy, that they, sorry, Dr. Uh, Sweeta and Dr. Gowans, who were the other two co-PIs on this uh, grant, right 
they got the first round of this grant right around when the pressure was kind of maximizing from the students. So then you had this alliance of student and faculty, and there was a little bit of money to spend. And so there was it was it gained visibility. And that was really powerful, right? This kind of combination of there was strong student groundswell interest, a little bit of money to make it more popular, more visible, and also faculty growing faculty pressure. And, and that kind of combined to really have an effect. And we had weird holdouts, you know, admissions for a long time was like, well, we can't, we got to give people water. It's Florida, they'll die, right? Like, um, and so we, you know, we ended up having this long protracted discussion of like, do we give everybody a reusable water bottle? And this is where like my thing tends to come in. And is that a good choice, right? Because the reusable water bottles, most of us have one. If, if you have more than like three, you're basically just lining them up on a shelf. And each reusable water bottle can be anywhere between 30 and 300 times higher an, uh, an environmental impact to make than a disposable water bottle. Um, and so, you know, it, then the next thing was, I think, boxed water. That might be still where they are, which I'm also like, it's, it's a cardboard box with plastic on the inside. You know what I mean? Like, it's, like, it's still like, not, not perfect. Um, I don't know where admissions has like ended its, its quest or its, or you know, honestly, its pressured quest for like a, a water it can hand out. But I do think that the groundswell of student activity plus some extra visibility plus some faculty pressure was a really powerful recipe for change. Uh, and, and I was surprised how fast it happened because it was like one year I was hearing no, 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 no. And the next year, President Eastman had signed it. And I was like, I, I felt a little whiplash. I was like, well, what happened? Um, okay, that was quick. Um, and, and it's been a, a long, slow adjustment, like I'll say, you know, there's lots of like things that you find on campus, and there's exceptions, right? There's scientific instruments that need to be single use. And, you know, we've had to carve out spaces for things. It's, it's been a learning process, but yeah, it was, it was happy. Um, I think I addressed Dr. J, and I don't know if I got all the way to Heather. Um, yeah, I think I think you did. I think you're inspiring us. Maybe hopefully the students are getting inspired too to try to think about how we can make a difference um, at our university as well. And, and I want to say this because this has been the exact question that you raise is one that like I've struggled with basically my entire life, right? Like I remember I got into environmental stuff because I saw a documentary on pollution at like 15, and I was I was astounded and like that kind of set me on this course. Um, I think that individual like attitudes and behaviors absolutely matter. But when we are each individual, we have very limited ability to make change because most of the things that cause things, I'm being vague on purpose, are systems, right? They are like contracts with beverage providers. They are, um, you know, the, the administration's policies on X and the, the way that the recycling system is organized. And the two things that I think are very important and maybe get overlooked are once you have your individual like orientation and you're trying to make a difference in your own life, generally one of the most powerful things you can do is, is, is group, right? Is like get together with other people who care about the same thing. It is, it, it is almost a magic power, right? Like, one person, five individual people versus five people that have formed a group, the group is far more powerful, right? They, they just are louder. They are able to get things done that no group of individuals is going to do. And the other thing, you know, I studied eco as part of my dissertation is they change norms within the group, right? So like I can be an individual who really cares about the environment and I'm careful about like what I buy for lunch and all this stuff. But then like I form a friend group with a bunch of people who all care about it. And our idea of what caring and acting is shifts way outside of the spectrum that I was going to attempt as an individual. Uh, and so that can be very, very powerful. And then the other thing that I think is really important is, you know, we have a very like individualistic kind of entrepreneurial focused culture. I think there is a huge opportunity for entrepreneurial activity that is focused on new ways of dealing with these problems, right? Ways that are, and, and like, they can be businesses, they can be like lots of different things, but basically like these very focused, energetic, new, like what's a new way, right? Like the, the edible plastic, right? Like at this point, that's a tiny little business in the middle of nowhere. 
But if there are a hundred different people all trying to find replacements for plastic in all of its different ways and like putting these new ideas out there and getting funding for them and selling them, like that can make a huge difference. Uh, because one of those will, will hit in one industry, one of those will hit in another industry, and we'll turn around and in five years we'll have so many options that are not just plastic. I mean, the I would say the the food, especially the meat world, is there right now, right? We we had I, I grew up as a kid. We had like you know TVP, like, you know, kind of bad alternative meats for like my entire childhood. My my stepmother was a vegetarian on and off, and like occasionally very weird things would show up in the refrigerator. Um, that most people are not going to eat. And now we have these like alternative meats that for all intents and purposes come close. They come close enough for a lot of folks, at least in terms of gravity. Like that can make a huge difference. And you know, that that was entrepreneurship. But the two companies that are doing this, I think one was a Stanford person and one was like some kind of I think it's just business like oriented person. And they decided to take this on as their mission. And they built two different companies that are doing this. And I think it's good there are two companies. I'd be thinking better if there were 10 companies. Um, you know, so I, I do think that individual behavior change matters a lot, but I think you then need to find ways to magnify the choices that you've made. Um, it's one of the reasons I became a teacher, actually. Like I was a I was a sustainability consultant, like all through my PhD. And like I was like writing these reports and helping companies strategize and coming up. And I was watching like half the work that I did get put in a drawer somewhere. Um, or be told that it would be too expensive or not, it now wasn't the right time, or the market wasn't ready or whatever. And I kept thinking, like, I, I, this is not like I'm, I love the work that I'm doing. I feel like I'm making a difference slowly but surely in the world. But then, like, one, I love being in the classroom. But two, I was like, if I train 50 people a year to like go out and do better, like that's that's huge, right? That, the multiplication there, it, like, the longer my career goes, the more like people there are out there who are thinking critically about these, who understand like maybe where the pressure points are, where they can actually like exert influence and make change. And that like, I, that was a, a system that works for me because I am, it, people don't necessarily believe it after I do like a presentation, but I'm an introvert. I don't like to, like th this pandemic has not been hard about for me because I have just stayed in my home with my wife and my kids and like, that's fine. <laughs> that is all the social activity I can handle a lot of times. Um, so I'm not good at organizing. I'm not good at like, you know, getting a group of people together to like, you know, go out there and, and tell people that they need to change. Um, but I can stand in front of a classroom, you know, and I, and I feel very comfortable like doing that. And I feel very happy that every year, you know, and then I start to get those emails back from my students and they're doing good things and they're making differences. And I'm like, you know, I didn't make them this way, but I helped them. And like that, that feels very powerful. So I, I think, the, the, literally the professions that we are in, like we are already kind of multiplying the the benefit of, of our own changes, right? And you can, you all, as you said, you committed to this as a way to make a difference. And it does. It maybe doesn't make a difference in that like every individual person like can move this all by their own individual change, but they go on to careers and they go on to do things. And they, you know, they find ways to multiply their efforts and just like we do. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> that's a lot of what I, I rest on because the world is, is rough. It really is. Um, it's, it's dark at times. I try real hard to organize my classes about like what we can do. Um, I start out with the like, you know, I, get, I gave the, I have teach sustainable cities and two days ago I gave the like, your lives are going to be nothing but like crisis mitigation. Like it's going to be rough, you know. And then I proceed to spend the rest of the semester trying to give them all the different ways that they can like make that better. But I, you know, we always have that moment where it's like, this is going to be hard. This is going to be really, really hard. But it can get better. I've talked for a long time. <laughs> Does anybody yeah. want to? Guess? Cameron, did you have a question? Oh, I suppose so. So my my thought is that because um, at the end of the day, if I'm Coca-Cola or I'm Pepsi, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about how can I make a quick buck? And essentially, I don't have any incentives on, you know, changing from a cheap, easy to use, easy to manufacture, you, you know, material like plastic. And I can just put, you know, my Coke in a, a, a cardboard box with plastic on the inside and say, hey, this is environmentally friendly. So like, you know, I, how, how, how can we fight against that when there's no incentive for them to change, really? 
the fight against them is a, is, a, is a weird one, right? Like it's Coca Cola; they own everything. Um, how do you fight a giant multinational corporation? Like, is it is a very hard question to answer? But you can, right? Coke also owns God knows how many brands, but they have all the little sub brands, right? And like, what they're what they're going to do if they're going to do anything is they're going to I don't know if they own Adwala or whatever it is, right? Some juice little thing. Like, they're going to roll out to that one, like the sustainable pack. And if you buy that instead of a Coke, it sends a signal, right? It's not like, but necessarily like, we we've changed Coca Cola to like in a DNA, um, but when you're dealing with a company, what they respond to is consumer demand. And so to a certain extent, what can you do? Like you can be very careful about what you purchase. You can try to influence other people about what they purchase. You can be very vocal, right? We got social media and influencers out there now. We can like basically like stand up and be like, I am no longer buying Coke products because I have found out X, Y, and Z. And like, here's what I'm gonna buy instead. Um, none of these are like a magic bullet. Um, you know, it, it's not like, oh, you stand up the titan of industry and they'll just like, they'll, ne they'll never see you coming or something, right? Um, so you, you have to figure out where you can apply pressure. I will say, like, when I was, um, when I was doing the sustainability consulting work, one of our customers briefly was McDonald's, right? Like, titan of industry. Um, and they were interested. They, they um, you know, they just like clamshell grills for their hamburgers. And they were interested in... Um, Essentially, they have Teflon sheets on the bottom. They were considering Teflon sheets on the top. Um, and the, their question was like, was the environmental impact of the additional Teflon sheet, was that countered by the additional beef that would be served, right? Because like, if it doesn't stick, then the actual hamburger that the customer gets is gonna have a little more beef in it than it would have otherwise. Because otherwise they scrape it off that top thing. Uh, and ultimately, right, like, on the one hand, it was a cost savings question. And like the reason McDonald's cared was if they could use these top Teflon sheets, then they could make smaller patties. And even if they only had to make them like 5% smaller, then that would be a huge savings for them. But they also wanted to be able to stand up and say like, this will be the environmental impact. And so, yeah, you're not necessarily gonna get these people to like change to like a radically more expensive, better process. But sometimes what you can do is like find that pressure point where they're like considering a change and say like, yeah, like, you know, I would be convinced by this environmental like message of yours. I would, if your bottles of Coke were 50% recycled plastic, like I would buy more Coke. Um, and, and that can make it, that can make a difference. Um, Again, when you're dealing with a company the size of this, it's, it's very hard to like, you're, you're nudging it at a boulder, but yeah, I mean, take a shot at it. And then if you can like, again, organizing, right? If you can get a, a group of thousands to all like, you know, repeat that message, then it will be heard and it may be responded to. That's the best I got. Thank well, you know. awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Sherry. Oh, this pleasure. was awesome. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Have a great yeah. evening. Yeah, take care. Good question. Bye, thank Dr. you. Sherry. Bye. Bye. I'll see some of you soon. Bye.